What a friend we have in Jesus All our sins and griefs to bear What a privilege to carry Everything to God in Often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Heavy trials and temptations. Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged Take it to the Lord in prayer Can we find a friend so fair? sorrow share Jesus knows our every weakness take it to the Lord in prayer Far from this spot in some unknown but not unhonored resting place lies all that was mortal a Francis Rodden Myra Crozier, Captain Royal Navy. So begins the marble tablet in Holy Trinity Church of Ireland, Church Square, Banbridge. While outside in the square are two more public memorials to one of Banbridge's most famous sons, Francis Crozier. The other, of course, being Joseph Scriven, the hymn writer and composer of that well-known hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. Occupying the centre of the square is the striking 7 foot 6 inch statue of Crozier, which stands on a substantial plinth and pedestal, depicting Crozier in his captain's uniform, looking northward. The memorial stands some 24 feet 6 inches high, with four oddly sized polar bears on guard at each corner of the memorial. Just across the square stands the impressive Avonmore House, now with a blue plaque at the door, where Crozier was born on the 17th of September, 1796, the 11th child of George and Jane Crozier and their fifth son. He was named Francis Rodden Moira Crozier, after Francis Rodden, the Earl of Moira, a friend of the family. Little is known of the early life of Francis, but it's certainly that it was one of privilege in a strongly religious household. Shortly after his birth, George Crozier abandoned the family's support for the Presbyterian faith and transferred his allegiance to the Church of Ireland, which continues to this day. His decision to transfer was partly because of the revolutionary activities of the Society of United Irishmen many of whom were Presbyterians, and in County Down that of course would be around Sainfield and Ballina Hinch. It is unclear why George Crozier allowed his son to leave this affluent life in Bonbridge for the harsh life of the Royal Navy, engaged in the Napoleonic Wars with France. In 1810 he approached his friend Lord Downshire of Hillsborough, to see whether he might be able to pull a few strings at the Admiralty. And shortly afterwards, Francis was accepted into the Royal Navy. He was still three months short of his 14th birthday, when he made not only his journey from Bonbridge to the Port of Cork, but also from boyhood to manhood. He enlisted on the 12th of June, 1810, and was posted aboard HMS Hemrod the 34-gun warship stationed in Cork. 
It was the beginning of a lifetime of duty and devotion to the Royal Navy. However harsh and brutal the conditions on board might be for the common sailor. At the end of 18 and 12, the 16 year old Crozier gained his first promotion when he was appointed midshipman, having learned fast the tools of his trade of mathematics, navigation, tidal calculation and general seamanship, all necessary for what would be an officer. Sir Thomas Staines took Crozier with him when he was appointed captain of Britain, a 44-gun frigate in 1812. And so began his life at sea on board the Britain. And in 1813, he rounded Cape Horn, the tip of South America, for the first time. A young lad of just 17 or 18 years going round Cape Horn. What an experience that must have been. By a mistake in calculation when they came into the Pacific, they came upon an island that did not appear in any map or charts that they had. On closer examination, they found that the island was populated and they were met by four canoes. And two of them came out on the canoe and spoke perfect English to the crew. How could this be? How could an island in the middle of the South Pacific, thousands of miles away from England, have these men speaking perfect English? Well, of course, the island was Pitcairn. And if you know your story of the mutiny and the bounty, this was the island on which the mutineers retired to in 17 and 90. On shore they met Thursday, October Christian, the son of Fletcher Christian, the mutineers' leader. And even of more importance, they met John Adams, the last survivor of the mutiny, and almost persuaded him to return to England with them after 30 years in hiding. We can only briefly mention Crozier's career for the next 20 years. Britain was now at peace. And what was to become for all of those servicemen, both sailors and soldiers, after the Napoleonic Wars? From 1821 to 1823, Crozier sailed with Edward Parry to explore the Northwest Passage off the north of Canada, in the hope that a passage could be found in those ice-filled waters from the Atlantic into the Pacific Oceans. Up to then, the only two options were the long route via the Cape of Good Hope in South Africa and the more dangerous route around Cape Horn off the coast of South America. The expedition was unsuccessful and with vital lessons that were not learned, lessons such as diet, clothing, shelter, transport, the size of the expedition, the more that they took with them, the more mouths would have to be fed. In 1826, Crozier was promoted to the rank of lieutenant, and in 1827, again he was off to the north, this time to explore the Arctic. For seven months at the age of 40, he was promoted to the rank of Commodore in the year 1837. In 1838, he returned home to Banbridge on the death of his mother, to make the necessary arrangements for the care of his three unmarried sisters, Rachel, Martha and Charlotte. In 1839, James Clark Ross was appointed leader of an expedition to the Antarctic and he invited Crozier to be his second demand. And together they would command the 19th century's greatest voyage of maritime explorer of the two ships, the Erebus and the Terror. The two ships which were to become part of the Crozier legend. They reached Hobart in Van Diemen's land which was not renamed Tasmania in 1855 in August and went to visit the Lieutenant Governor Sir John Franklin. They spent three months in Hobart preparing for the expedition and it was here that Crozier found love for he fell deeply in love with Franklin's pretty young niece Sophia Crocroft. Sophie, a 24-year-old, was the daughter of Sir John's sister, Isabella Crocroft, the last 
it was not to be. While she respected Crozier, she never came to love him. Ross and Crozier sailed south and crossed the Antarctic Circle on New Year's Day, 1841. They returned to Hobart in April. And then they sailed again at the beginning of July and were off the coast of New Zealand by the 7th of August. Sailing south towards the Antarctic waters on the 23rd of November. After many weeks of exploration and a collision between the two ships, they sailed north towards the Falkland Islands, which they reached on the 6th of April, 1842. And again, after rounding Cape Horn, it was on East Falkland that Commander Francis Crozier learned that he had been promoted to the rank of captain from back in August 1841. It had taken him 31 years of loyal service to the Royal Navy to reach the Cherig Sir status of captain. After major repairs, both ships left the Falklands on the 17th of December 1842, sailing south. And it was to be the worst weather the expedition ever experienced. Gales and thick ice forced Ross to concede defeat and they made preparations to sail home, leaving on the 30th of April, 1843. The shores of England were finally sighted on the 2nd of September and docking on the 23rd of September, four years after their first sailing. 1844 was not a good year for Crozier. The physical exhaustion and the mental strain on his life was evident. He toured much of Europe while preparations were being made for another expedition to the Northwest Passage. Who should command the expedition was of paramount importance. Captain Crozier was one of the most experienced officers in the Royal Navy, and yet he declined after four years in Antarctic. He felt he was not up to the hardship of leadership. However, out of a sense of duty, he was prepared to serve as second in command. And in the end, Sir John Franklin was appointed commander. Franklin had returned to England from Van Diemen's land, not exactly covered in glory. Later, it was said of Franklin on the expedition, it was to be led by a man who got the job because everybody felt sorry for him. Not exactly the best reason for such an important appointment. And after much preparation, including installing steam engines for the first time in these ships, as well as sail power, the Erebus under Sir John and the Terror under Captain Crozier were towed down the Thames and into the North Sea, accompanied by a supply ship, the Barreto Junior, on the 19th of May, 1845. They sailed north up the North Sea and docked in the Orkney Islands for a few days before setting sail again on the 3rd of June, arriving at the Danish settlement of Disco of Greenland. Supplies, letters for home and some six sailors were transferred onto the Barreto Junior and she departed for home, her mission completed. At 6 a.m. on the 13th of July, the two ships of the expedition set sail across Baffin Bay and into Lancaster Sound, the entrance to the Northwest Passage. And they were observed by several ships, making contact with some of them. In the last two weeks of July and the first week of August, there was a positive sighting by a Captain Robert Martin of the whaling ship Enterprise. He recorded that as he sailed the hunting grounds sometime between the 29th and 31st of July, he could see the tips of the masts of the two ships in the distant horizon. All was normal of the Erebus and Terror, and all 129 souls and born vanished, never to return. With no modern means of communication, and everyone all they could do was wait. Lady Franklin visited several countries during this time, including France, Madeira and the United States. During 1846 and towards the end of that year, 17 months after sailing, 
She wrote to James Clark Ross expressing her anxiety that something was wrong. During the early months of 1847, several Arctic explorers also expressed concern. But up until now, the Admiralty was taking the view, it's much too soon, all is well. However, finally in the winter of 1847, 1848, not one, but three relief expeditions were commissioned. One to search the coast of Russian America, which we would call now Alaska, nothing was found. Another was overland and also no trace of the Franklin and his men were found. The said James Ross sailed the same route as Franklin and in the summer of 1848, three years after Franklin, but again nothing was found. And with frozen seas they returned home. Other attempts were made, yet to no avail. At last, on the 23rd of August, 1850, HMS assistance found the first traces of the expedition at Cape Riley on the southwest tip of Devon Island. Naval stores, some clothing, preserved meat tins were found. Other ships converged on the location, and it was a sailor from the ship, the Lady Franklin, brought the news that three graves had been found, and on the board was recorded the last resting place of three sailors. One John Torrington, a leading stoker, who departed this life on the 1st of January 1846. On board at HMS Tower, and 20-year-old John Hartnell, an able seaman, served on board HMS Erebus. He died on the 4th of January, aged 25 years. William Brain, a Royal Marine, he also served in Erebus. And he died on the 3rd of April, 32 years old, in 1846. These were all young men, and yet within the first year of sailing, something had gone terribly wrong. Further south, by overland route, John Ray found some equipment. But little else was found. On the 20th of January 1854, the Admiralty let it be known that unless some positive news was received, the men's name would be removed from the naval list and they would be declared dead. In April 1854, John Ray, working for the Hudson Bay Company, found evidence of the men. He spoke with some Inuit or Eskimos who had items to trade, and they also told of hearing of a large group of white men who had died somewhere to the west. From others, Ray obtained a silver fork and spoon embossed with a family crest and the initials F-R-N-C. Ray didn't, of course, realise at the time that he was looking at the initials of Francis Rodden Myra Crozier. Heard the story of 40 men travelling south from King William Island four winters past in 1850. They were dragging sledges, but were all now dead. Remains had been found near the mouth of the Great Fish River. Most distressing, Ray was told that evidence was clear that the men had been driven to the last dread alternative as a means of sustaining life. On returning to London, with this news of cannibalism, and as a result of a wave of horror and revulsion spread across the nation, even Charles Dickens joined in. The Indian yet were telling lies. How could the flower of the English Navy, these Christian men, would never be engaged in such a practice? In 1857, the Fox, a ship under the command of an Irishman named Francis Leopold McClintock, at age 38, from Dundalk, set sail for the northwest, locating into the ice in the April 1858. In May 1859, in King William Island, they found a small cylinder which contained the words of Lieutenant Hobson, a brief statement of the movements of the lost expedition. It is now known as the Victoria Point Note, and that brief statement is one of the most significant documents in the history of exploration. It is dated the 28th of May, 
1847, two years after the expedition set sail, and the note concluded that all was well. However, all was not well. Squeezed around the margins of the note, written some 11 months later, it was a second message. Describes the desperate change in their circumstances. They had abandoned their ships on the 22nd of April, 1847, having been frozen in the ice since September 1846. The officers and crew of 105 men were under the command now of Captain Crozier, for the note told the news that Sir John Franklin was death on the 11th of June, 1847. This additional information was signed by James Fitzjames, Captain of HMS Erebus, and Francis Crozier, Captain and Senior Officer. After signing his name, Crozier added, and that on tomorrow the 26th for Bax Fish River. Probably the last thing Crozier ever wrote. McClintock and his crew found many other articles, including remains scattered around and in an upturned boat. The fox returned home, bringing news that the remains had been found far south to prove that Crozier had led his men to the last link in the chain that made up the Northwest Passage, proving that the doomed expedition had at least achieved its goal. Legend reports that Crozier was the last man standing. Memorials were erected. The best known to us is the imposing statue of Crozier opposite Evanmore House in Church Square, Banbridge, and a family plaque in the parish church in the opposite the house. The statue is one of seven foot six inch Crozier in his Royal Navy uniform of captain, with the small, uh, four small polar bears on guard at each corner of the memorial. It was paid for by the people of Banbridge, costing the sum then of £700, approximately £30,000 today. And there are no less than eight points of the world map which bear Crozier's name. But Perhaps the most significant memorial lies approximately 239,000 miles from Church Square, Bond Bridge. That is quite some distance, and of course it's on the surface of the moon. Crozier name has been given to a large crater on the moon's surface. And so the story of Franklin's Dune Northwest Passage Expedition faded into the mists of time. But it was not to be the end of the story but only the end of a chapter. In 2014, the Canadian authorities sent a Coast Guard icebreaker into the area and using the latest underwater technology, having found a piece of metal from the Erebus the previous day, the crew of the Sir Wilfrid Laurier, the icebreaker, on the 2nd of September 2014, found the sunken ship, the Erebus, Franklin's ship, Two years later, in 2016, Crozier's ship, the Terror, was also found. And so our story is right up to date. Because in the local paper, the Banbridge Chronicle, even today, stories are now being shown of Crozier. And the photographs taken from the underwater cameras show very clearly the contents of the ship, even into Crozier's cabin. And so the story of Crozier is still being written. So we finish with these verses, words first of all written by Tennyson, that on this memorial in Westminster Abbey, not here the white man's north hath thy, my sons, and thy heroic sailor soul are passing on thy heavenly journey toward no earthly pole. So our story comes to an end for this time. We finish with again the memorial of this family placed in Holy Trinity Church, Banbridge. That indeed, far from this spot, in some unknown but not unhonoured resting place, lies all that was mortal of Francis Rodden Myra Crozier, Captain, Royal Navy. We salute his courage. We honour his memory.
Day. 